and hello and welcome from my side as well. And really warm-hearted warm welcome to hear about hear my passionate rant about what can go wrong with your Azure environments. My name is Carl Otz, and I'm a cloud and security expert with uh, years of Azure experience. And this is really a collection of Azure security fails that I have stumbled upon my career as a consultant and both as an in-house uh, cloud security expert. As a consultant, I've seen hundreds of different Azure environments, uh, small or large, from the small startups uh, that want to scale, scale high, all the way up to the Fortune 500 enterprises. And the format of this session is structured in the way that, depending on the questions uh, that you might ask during, during this session, we might spend some more time in a particular uh, finding or an anti-pattern anti or a fail, uh, as I like to call them. I have a half a dozen of these uh, prepared in, in more detail and more than happy to discuss any of these more, more further regarding your own cases as well. With that, let's, uh, let's get started. So the first, the most common one across any industries or application uh, structures or any experience uh, of the, with the cloud, the number one most common and the pattern or a failure that I see across public cloud users is really using these unprotected public endpoints. And how is that impactful? How, how bad is it really? Well, here is an example of two virtual machines running 24 hours, just one full day, unprotected in the internet. They are fully patched. I've just created them into the public Azure cloud, two Windows virtual machines. Um, and as you can see, I'm running a query against their security logs. Um, I'm querying for uh, this Windows event IT. Uh, event ID that actually matches for a failed logging attempt. And out, out of that failed logging attempt, I'm actually querying only grouping those results by the target account name. So you'll see that I actually have, during this 24 hours, I have over 3000 different usernames that were attempted to log in into my virtual machines. And if you have a look at any of these in the top, those main administrator in different languages and different ways of, of writing that, my personal favorite is the Swedish administrator with an umlaut on top of the O. Um, you'll see that each of those has been targeted more than, more than once. So we actually have tens of thousands of uh, log, failed login attempts only within a period of 24 hours. Uh, that uh, that we are getting bombarded. Essentially, anyone can just go ahead and download Microsoft's list of public IP addresses of, of Azure, which is more or less a third of the whole internet, and can just start scanning whatever is available there. So you you can no longer hide bit behind uh, the fact that you are you are not going to be found out. There's someone more interesting. And this, of course, does not. Uh, apply only to infrastructure as a service. So the sim similarly, the default settings for most Azure services and any public cloud services, no matter, the default settings actually uh, allow for public access anywhere, even on unauthenticated versions as well. So how, how are we going to fix that? Well, first of all, you should really consider every public IP address that is assigned to your your resources, your ser cloud services, a risk. And you should really carefully review, do you really need to have a publicly available endpoint or a public IP resource to be, to be more specific in the infrastructure as a service in Azure? If, you, if you're adamant that you really, really want that, then for your infrastructure as a service environments, you should have a look at the native network security groups and security centers just-in-time access 
to limit the access with this uh, fairly simple allow deny rule sets that access act as access control lists but even if you use a separate uh, appliance for your firewalling or you use something else i still recommend you to use network security groups because that's the only way for you to gain network security group flow logs meaning actually those software defined networking logs across all of your infrastructure as a service if you enable security centers just in time access you are actually able to set the default rules to deny and only when needed open up the access only to the requester's ip address so you can leave it limit the available time that your ports are open and finally uh, the best approach from Azure security point of view would be to use uh, HTML5 uh, remote desktoping to Azure Bastion. In that case, you don't actually open up public network security groups into your IP addresses at all. You are keeping everything within your network perimeter in Azure. And instead of signing in using RDP into your virtual machines, you will manage those VMs. Uh, by logging into the Azure portal and uh, using a HTML5 render, rendering of that desktop. And if you log into Azure portal, we can actually enforce any conditional access from the Azure Active Directory. One of them is, of course, the secure network locations. And for platform as a service components, specifically for data, uh, you should really have a look at either the virtual network or IP address based firewalls, sometimes titled firewalls or service endpoints, or even if you're worried about data exfiltration, you can even go one step further and also manage your own DNS names as well and use private endpoints. In that case, data never leaves your controlled network environment and you have specifically logs available for all of that traffic. So how do we do that? In Azure Storage, here's an example of uh, configuring, configuring that firewall for Azure Storage. We can add virtual networks uh, into the firewall. Again, by default, all networks are able to access the storage account. I need to specifically go ahead and select that I want to allow access only for from a selected network subset. I can go ahead and select any networks here that I have access to. I can even add manually some IP address ranges uh, in addition to those virtual networks as well. But then there's a little bit trickier part over here, which is the allow trusted Microsoft services to access this storage account. And trusted Microsoft services are, it's that's quite a vague uh, list it keeps on updating just recently azure api management was added to that list but essentially it's a series of microsoft azure resources or software as service resources that are related uh, to azure development for example azure devops services are just uh, only about to be added as trusted services there but there you cannot specify between your Azure resources or your Microsoft services that you trust or any Microsoft services that you trust. So it's a little bit of a balance there. Okay. Next up is the scenario when you actually want to store, want to provide public access into uh, your Azure Storage account. In that case, you cannot just add IP address based firewall rules into your storage account because you will need to open up essentially effectively to all of your users. If you only want to provide secure access to some parts of the content to some of the users, uh, quite uh, not as well known feature of shared access signature SES tokens is actually that you can even add in addition to the expiry date for the SES token you can even enforce that only HTTPS can be used for those 
for this SAS token. But more importantly, even you can enforce which IP addresses are allowed to use this SAS token. So you can add your network controls per unknown SAS token users as well. Okay, let's move on from networking and let's talk about broken authorization. And I really, really mean broken. A very typical case when I go to any environment is that every Azure user is an owner and even worse in the subscription scope. That means that they can do almost anything within your Azure environment, including kicking yourself out or creating any amount of costs. But owner is the default role for new subscriptions. And that's why quite often when Azure is taken into use in a uh, agile and explorative manner, new people who are added to the environment just get added the same access that the original one had, just in case. But really, you should really limit the use of owner because owner can manage user access in addition to managing resources in the scope that it's added in. And with user access, uh, it can manage, remove existing access, but it can also add access to new people who are not specifically added according to your own best practices. And how, how do you fix that then? So we should really separate the duties between duties of the owner into two pieces. We can have the contributor role for those who need to manage Azure resources, creating services, modifying SQL serv services, etc. And we should separate the owner roles into these contributors and also the user access administrator. There is a built-in role that is only about managing user access called this user access administrator, but it's not as often used as the owner. Quite often I see project owners or the eventual business owners having the owner access just in case or because they need to have manage access to others. And that really shouldn't be the case. They should have user access administrator in that case. And this way, as user access admin has right access to the Microsoft authorization resource provider, you are able to limit and really minimize the amount of owners you have in your environment. But that's not it. You should also be aware that contributor role sometimes also has access to, uh, also allows for managing access when we, when we are talking about the data tier, not just the raw Azure management pane, but the data tier. Services like Azure Key Vault, Azure Storage Account, which I showed earlier, and Azure SQL Database actually allow a contributor role user to change who has access to the data. A Key Vault contributor, or sorry, excuse me, a contributor who has access to a Key Vault has actually also access to the whole access policy of the Key Vault. This key vault does not use role-based access control to manage access. It uses its, uses its own access policies, just like storage with those SAS tokens. So as a contributor, I can go ahead and add anyone who is in our Azure Active Directory and grant them any access into the key vault. Again, with the SQL, Azure SQL database, if I'm a contributor, I can go ahead and manage the main administrator of the master database of the whole SQL server, SQL logical server. That's a very powerful privilege that I have as a contributor. You should be really careful of not just removing owner access and splitting that into all contrib and user access admin, but also going deeper and thinking about the scope of your contributor roles. And Related to that scope, first of all, role-based access control assignments are inherited, meaning that if you give me an owner, uh, if you give me a contributor role or any role of that matter right now, 
if I just play the waiting game and wait for you to actually add any resources into the same scope, I have automatically access to the, all of those future resources into the same scope that have that are created within uh, within the scope I have access to. And if I have subscription or resource group level privileges, this also applies to any resources that are inherited across this, uh, this resource scope. So you should really minimize subscription scope assignments and you should really prefer at maximum resource group level assignments. Once you scope your key vaults and, and, and other data tier services into separate resource groups and give your developers uh, direct access inside the data tier there and give contributor access to resource groups where they will store their co compute, you're already pretty pretty well ahead. Okay, let's move on and talk about my next favorite topic of rant, which is missing audit logging. And I really mean missing. I don't mean insufficient audit logging, like you get this very polite uh, finding in your OWASP uh, checks and security uh, checklist, but really missing audit logging altogether. It's important to know that most Azure services by default do not emit any sort of audit logs at all. They could have, at some, some of them who do emit, they could have a very minimal, uh, minimal retention time for those audit logs. So even if you know that the logs are available, you should really see what, is the set, what are the settings for the retention. Is this something that you can configure on your own? And somewhat counterintuitively, this is also true with these very security-focused services, such as Azure Key Vault, even, and which whole port, port, point of the service is to secure access and control and monitor access to secrets. So auditing should be pretty fundamental. As well as even Azure Web Application Firewall. A, a web application firewall without audit logging seems somewhat redundant. But there you go. The argument here is that because there is an extra cost uh, property associated with storing of, storing of those logs, Microsoft gives you the possibility to opt out of that as well. And how do you actually enable those audit logs? Well, here's an example from uh, Azure Key Vault. There's no place called audit logging here you actually go into diagnostic settings under monitoring as if you will troubleshoot something. And underneath these diagnostic settings, you can actually configure two different types of uh, two different types of log sources, audit events, which cover events such as uh, this particular uh, user access, this particular secret or even also these performance metrics, uh, which are then covered within the all metrics uh, source. I typically recommend adding both of those, uh, emitting both of those uh, metrics in terms of adding you some more material for your non-repudiation work. And as you add the diagnostic setting here, you also need to define the target. Where are you storing your logs? You can select the storage account, log analytics workspace, or if you want to export those outside of your Azure AD tenant, you can use an Azure Event Hub uh, to integrate with uh, third-party uh, services and locations as well. And there are even some automatic alerting available for us that are based on this and other types of raw data and metrics. For example, Azure Security Center is an umbrella for a lot of these advanced threat protection alerts for different types of services, such as Azure Storage, Azure Key Vault, Azure Resource Manager itself, and many others. Uh, here are some examples from Azure Storage Advanced Threat Protection. 
So the only thing you need to do is just enable the security center standard tier for your storage account. And there is an additional cost per storage account transaction. And you will get automatically alerted from these and many other uh, security related events. So what, what type of events we have here? We have unusual activities, we have unexpected deletes, we have data exfiltration, somebody dumping out all of the data. Uh, some users who regular, regularly use only, used to only add data, now suddenly start reading. Uh, we have access permission changes, we have access from unusual location, and so forth. Uh, this really works. So when I went ahead uh, and turned this on in my storage account, I actually after a while got alerted from uh, from the storage account advanced threat protection service that someone has signed into my storage account with real credentials mind you this was for all intents and purposes a legitimate use case but there was something different from it the location was actually different they used mozilla firefox as the user agent over here and they also logged in from Kuusankoski, Finland. Well, besides being quite a long uh, and, and a mouthful, it's literally in the middle of nowhere. And Finland be, being in the middle of nowhere even adds that. So really, this was someone just uh, logging in from their summer cottage. But I would have, I wouldn't have no idea if this was happening or if this was legitimate or not. So this is a very meaningful alert from Security Center. If I'm not happy with these automatic ones, I can even go ahead and create some custom alerts as well. Here's an example of uh, activity log alert, somebody going ahead and using the contributor access to listing storage account keys, those account and master keys that which you, which you leak, you can do anything. Here's a Activity log alert that, uh, that for this resource provider action, I want to fire on an alert, and then I can get this alert consumed into, sent into email. I can send, get this sent into as a push notification to my Azure mobile application. I can send it to Teams, to a webhook, anywhere. And even one more alerting related, uh, related issue. Or, or option here. This is a real example of a, a real application where we found out that we were under a denial of service attack. And we found it out much later, but before we actually realized that we had received uh, the alert like this uh, from our Azure application insights. We didn't really believe this. We thought this is something, uh, something was just going on with uh, with Azure. We dismissed this altogether. But as you'll see, we get these anomaly alerts, quote unquote, machine learning alerts or smart alerts from App Insights that give us additional context context related to what is it that is that is different from the the normal use cases. Are the error codes the same? Are the server responses the same? Are the, uh, the payloads that the clients are using similar and so forth? Okay. I mentioned earlier those uh, storage account access keys. And there's a whole discussion and whole different uh, session of its own about secret management in in Azure and in any ways in application development, but specifically for storage account access keys. Uh, they are so powerful, they are, they are have been part of such widely discussed and, and publicized data exfiltration cases uh, that this is really something that you should fix as part of your regular reg, regular reviews of uh, of improving your security posture 
So storage account access keys should really be stored outside. They should be stored in Azure Key Vault. They should be rotated automatically so that if there is a leak of those storage account master keys, then the actual damage will be will be very limited. You should, of course, add Azure Active Directory to Azure Key Vault uh, access control, and you should audit the Azure Key Vault utilization as well. Even better, if at all possible in your application or specific clients that you are using, you should even use data pane role-based access control roles for storage accounts so that you will need to use storage account access keys at all. That means that you can grant them reader access in the management pane and then perhaps storage, storage blob data contributor or storage blob data owner role in role-based access control. And that way they will need to have access to the storage account master keys at all. Even better for your own applications, you could create managed identities for your Azure services and grant those data pane role-based access control roles to those managed identities. If you recall from the earlier slide, my custom activity log alert, this is the specific resource provider action uh, that I used for erasing that alert, microstorage storage accounts list keys action. You need to have contributor access uh, or, or other storage write storage resource provider write type of access to run this but by default the contributor can do this they can get these keys and they can do after that anything with uh, with azure storage account and with the data specifically so you should really restrict access to this action either by limiting and scoping out that using azure storage uh, excuse me azure role-based access control assignments or by adding may, perhaps a custom policy that blocks this action altogether. Or maybe just alerting and sh share, sharing the names, names and uh, blaming them uh, of uh, maybe within your internal uh, development team that uh, they are now using this, this legacy authentication method that they should not be using. They should be using uh, getting the, that access key from the key vault. That's also a great way to drive uh, drive change in, in, in some teams. Okay, moving on. Another way of over engineering or uh, engineering yourself in, into a corner is creating these custom roles that you will use uh, in Azure to overcome some of the limitations of role-based access control assignments and scopes. But there are plenty of issues uh, with these custom roles which really you should not be using at all. And here's one example. Uh, based on the environment that you are using, if you're using, for example, the Azure portal, the Azure portal actually concatenates Excuse me. The Azure portal actually explicitly uh, clears out any white spaces from the role name, which means that I can have a custom role that looks very much like a role like any other. As you'll see, I have reader, contributor, and owner. They look exactly the same. It doesn't. There doesn't seem to be anything different to it, other than if I actually happen to go ahead and. Uh, click on the information box there. I'll see that the description says custom RBAC role fake reader. And that's interesting. It looks like a reader role, but it's not a reader role. So what's up with this? Well, this is a custom role. This name is again custom RBAC ro role with double O fake reader, and it's assigned into my subscription. But what can it actually do? It can go ahead and delete backups of my Azure App Service. It can go ahead and delete my AKS clusters. And it can even list the cluster admin credentials of my AKS. So it can go in, get inside of my AKS cluster 
and gain access to my applications there. A very, very, very powerful role hidden into something that, as you see, is not actually reader, but it has additional white spaces around it. This is accepted by the ARM engine. There are different rules that uh, that are blocked. You cannot just use the name reader because it's already in use. Um, but there are ways of getting around that. So this is something that I see as an anti-pattern often a lot of in a lot of environments, the complexities of proper access control in Azure are engineered around with custom roles. And that's when you introduce chances to spoof yourself through and rem remain undetected in a realistic looking role uh, for quite some time. So don't use custom roles. And then we have the untrusted authentication providers being used. And this is actually my, my last specific topic, uh, last founding, last fail. And then we'll move on to the additional resources. And by untrusted authentication provider, I really mean that in Azure role-based access control, we always trust into a central identity provider. By default, it's the uh, Azure Active Directory that your subscription is associated with. But you can also invite people from Microsoft account, Gmail, any external Azure Active Directory, and even uh, with the one-time password, even just anyone with an email address. And when you invite them, you don't know where does this address actually, especially if it's a custom domain, you don't know if, it, if this is coming from Microsoft account, Gmail, or an Azure AD, or something completely different. So if you are using an external, uh, if you are using an external identity, you should only rely on Azure Active Directory. Uh, you should consider this as, as federation as you, you, you do in Active Directory as well. So you should always only use trusted Azure Active Directories there. You should really monitor access to your Azure subscription, even if you don't implement role-based access control with privileged identity management, but you should really monitor your access using uh, privileged identity management. You get great audit logging on and monitoring and information about privileged use cases. If an awareness campaign and just best practice sharing is not enough, you can even limit this capability. So by default, anyone who is a member of your Active Directory can invite anyone from any authentication provider. You can limit this within your Azure Active Directory So you can take away the member, members can invite property. That means that you need to have a specific additional role in Azure Active Directory, such as a guest inviter role, to actually invite any guests. It's a good way to control that if you have a centralized uh, property available. Even worse, you'll see even the guests can invite is also something that, that can be uh, enabled. Once you have limited the access who can invite, and once you have a process of how do you onboard guests, you can start to restrict which identity providers your Azure Active Directory even trusts at all. So you can set this into allow invitations only to specific, specified domains. This way you are able to, you can, you can actually start building a list of trusted federation targets, quote unquote. It's a little bit artificial uh, because it's not a true federation, but still it's a uh, allowed third, third party or external collaboration target. All of these settings are something that are dependent on 
the centrally managed Active Directory teams' uh, capabilities and maturity in Azure. If you are talking about any any Azure subscription or uh, environment or an application, typically we don't have as application development teams any control over this. So we should treat these or we should assume that these are at the worst possible options as I have here on my exam. All right. So as a call to action for everyone, I recommend you to use the Secure DevOps Kit for Azure or AZSK, which is a set of tools uh, for assessing your security uh, environments, the security of your Azure environments. It's uh, built by Microsoft's uh, core engineering, so Microsoft IT, and they use those for roughly a thousand subs. So really main assessing the security at scale. Um, most of the fails that I described here can actually be detected using HSSK. Uh, it's not perfect. There's some uh, opinionated controls uh, or, or targets there, but it gives you great insights of where are you actually? What is your security posture? Either as an individual application owner or application developer or centrally as well. So yeah, use HSSK. You can get it from hsk.azurewebsites.net. Uh, it's really just a PowerShell module. Um, you run it, you authenticate in PowerShell against your subscription. You run it either targeting your subscription or a specific resource type or a resource group. And then you wait for it to scan, uh, scan your Azure environments. If you have more resources, then it takes more time. If you have fewer resources, then it can be completed in a matter of a uh, matter of uh, five five minutes or so. Excellent. So with that, we are at the end of end of the slides. Now, if you if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them here in the chat. I'll be I'll be here as long as long as long as you need me answering any any of the questions here. The slides won't be available. The recordings will be avail available at the Skill Me Up website. You can follow me in Twitter using my Twitter name Carl G Otz. And with that, I thank you very much and see you back there in the Q and A section of uh, Teams Live.